And um, here's what I want to want to say. I think this is the most important Q and A I could ever do. What I'm going to do right now, because uh, a good question was laid upon the podium, and I know that last week you guys talked about human sexuality and stuff like that. Which, uh, good night to miss, huh, Hammerschmidt? Um, and actually, it's something I love talking about is the church's teaching on human sexuality. It's partly what allowed me to say I'm all in when it comes to the church. But with that being said, a question was laid upon the, the podium here, and it says, I've tried other options, but nothing has worked to help my body. My gynecologist suggests using contraception for health benefits. Is it still considered a grave matter? What an incredible question, right? I mean, it's an incredible question. And so I stepped forward thinking, well, I'm going to answer this question. But because it's such an important question, I also said to myself, but make sure you're answering it correctly. And this is what, what I'm saying that matters most. Out of all the Q&As I've done, this is what matters most that I say to you. What was my next step? I typed in the Catholic Answers website. It's a difficult website to remember, so you might need to write this down. Catholic.com. <laughs> I got to the search engine, and I just said, I think if I go back, my search was contraception for medical reasons. That's all I searched. And the first two Q&As that came up, can we contracept for medical reasons? My husband and I want another baby, but we're told by my doctor that because of my health problems, we should use contraceptives for at least a year. Our priest agreed with the doctor and said the church allows for the use of contraception when a pregnancy would seriously jeopardize a woman's health. Somehow this doesn't sound right. What does the church teach? And take note, what did these people do? They talked to a doctor and they went to their priest. And they typed it into Catholic Answers. And the answers, <laughs> your priest is terribly misinformed. The deliberate use of contraception on the part of spouses to prevent a pregnancy is never illicit or okay. Okay. But the good news is that wasn't the only question that came up. The next one, birth control for medical reasons. Full question. Is it a sin to use birth control in marriage for medical reasons? It's a little different question, understand, than, than the first question. The answer. Medical treatments used for the purpose of treating or alleviating a medical condition that also have a birth control effect, in parentheses, an effect that is not desired, are acceptable. Now, the church does not consider the illicit use, it does not consider wrong or illicit the use of those therapeutic means necessary to cure bodily diseases, even if a foreseeable impediment to procreation should resu result therefrom, provided such impediment is not directly intended for any motive whatsoever. And he goes in a little bit deeper in this answer to a thing called the principle of double effect. Principle of double effect. And I know I'm getting to like, right now I'm going a little bit deep. And you're like, whoa, man, I just want a yes or no answer. <laughs> All of this that I'm reading to you is right there. It comes up almost like that on Catholic Answers website, catholic.com. It's better than I can answer it. These are the experts. These are the people that, that have done all of the research. And, and priests were good. You know, we go to seven hours to uh, seven years of seminary to learn these things. But as I have mentioned time and time again, that never has it been easier in the history of the world to understand what the Catholic Church teaches than it is right now. 
and if it's on Catholic.com and it's one of their experts answering the question, you can trust it. And they're usually even going to do a really good job of explaining why it is the way it is. Um, now there's also something called the forums. Forums. Catholic Answers Forums. Where somebody poses a question. And then other people chime in with their answers. Please understand that that's different than the Catholic Answers staff or the professionals answering those questions. The forums are more just, no, no. And, and so one of the things I also looked at real quick was one of the forums. And some guy said, no, it's never permissible, ever, 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 ever. Which is simply not Catholic teaching. A little bit later on, it talks about the principle of double effect. And then it kind of explains what that means. And then it, it explains a little bit more. It says, in the case of using for health purposes a treatment that has a contraceptive effect is generally seen as permissible under the above mentioned conditions for double effect. Here's what we need to ask. If sexual activity was not taking place, would this treatment still be the best course of action? Okay, let me repeat that. If sexual activity was not taking place, would this treatment still be the best course of action? If yes, then it would appear that we have met the threshold for the principle of double effect. The intended purpose of taking that contraceptive or whatever, that, that medication that would also have that effect, the principal reason for doing it was not so that you would not conceive. Do you see the difference between that and the first question? And so all of that's really, I really believe that, that these are the things that you don't have to say, gosh darn it, I wish Father Gale was here. Because doggone it, I would ask him, don't wait for me to show up. And, and, and you can't trust every source that you have online, even if, even if it says Catholic in the name. But you can trust Catholic.com. You can trust formed.org. And really, if you stick with those two, you don't have to branch out too far. Ascension Press Presents. Those are the three that I'm throwing at people more than anything else right now. You can trust the Lighthouse Media CDs. Ascension Press Presents, that's the Mike Schmitz videos, Father Mike Schmitz videos, they're incredible. And some other people that also work for Ascension Presents. You've got form.org, and you've got catholic.com. With all of that, you're going to get all of your questions answered. You can trust those things. Good. Today's topic, and, and, I, and I also heard that there may still be some lingering questions from last week. Why can the church teach what it teaches? Again, don't, don't just wait for Father Ryan and myself to answer those questions. Why does the Catholic Church teach what it teaches? And, and sometimes isn't it better, right, to just get online, maybe when you're in a room by yourself, saying, why does the Catholic Church teach what it teaches? Now, obviously, it's going to be, you'd be a little more courageous asking the question to a computer screen than to a priest in the midst of a big group. Don't be afraid to, to find out what the church teaches, and it's all right there. CatholicAnswers.com. Brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Okay. Um, if you still have lingering questions after you've checked out Catholic.com, want to talk with me about it, Father Ryan about it some more, you know, we're definitely willing to do that. I just now saw you, Father Ryan. For this whole time, I'm like, wow, I thought Father Ryan would be here tonight. I wonder what he's, what he's doing. And I was imagining, like, you eating ice cream somewhere, just having a, a gay old time. So it's great to have you. Um, today's topic is actually... Catholic social teaching. It's funny that we have spent quite a considerable amount of time talking about what the Catholic Church teaches. But nothing will witness more strongly to the beauty of the Catholic faith than when one of its members follows its social teaching. 
has there been a bigger proponent for the Catholic Church in the last 100 years than Mother Teresa? I dare say no. And what did she do? She simply lived out, day by day, Catholic social teaching by showing mercy and by showing love. If you want to know where the, the basis of Catholic social teaching comes, you need not do much more than open up your Bible to Matthew 25. And in verse 31, he, I'm sorry, in verse, Thirty-one. Yeah, I was right the first time. He says this. I'll just read you about half of the 25th chapter of Matthew. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate them one from another as a, sheep, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right, but the goats at his left. And by the way, in case you're wondering, the sheep, that's the good people. The goats, and you're going to read more about this here later on in this story, the goats on his left, they're no good. Sheep on the right, goats on the left. Important for you to remember, if the Lord ever appears to you face to face, what's the first thing you should do? Take a large step to your left. Then you'll be on his right where he will keep the sheep. Think about it. All right. Jesus, it's so good to see you. You don't want to go the other direction because then you're going to be on his left, and that's no bueno. You'll, you'll hear more about this. He will play the, place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty. And here's the thing, okay? These are also called the corporal works of mercy. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous were Answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you? The hungry, thirsty, naked, a stranger, sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you. And he will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it for the one of the least of these, you did it to me, as you did it to one, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So huge, the church is teaching on social justice. So huge. And the Lord, yes, calls us to orthodoxy, right teaching. But the other word that would go along with this is orthopraxy, right practice. Is that right, Father Ryan? Orthopraxy, right practice. And how do you live your life? Because you can have all of the right teaching you want, but if it doesn't change the way you live your life, if you're not living in accordance with our Lord's teaching on social matters, then we would say that you probably don't have the teaching whatsoever very similar to the homily I gave this past weekend about faith and, and the actions that must accompany those that faith. Amen, amen, amen. I will now shut up. Maria, let us watch some videos. Interesting to me because even a thing like the social teaching of the church, 
uh, for Father Ryan and I, we would have spent two or three semesters taking classes just continually on something that they're trying to, you know, I mean, we're trying to teach within a 45-minute session. Uh, at the end, we know that it all boils down to love your neighbor as yourself or, or love your neighbor as God loves you. And, um, but that's not always easy to figure out, like, what is the very best way to love? You know, it seems like I'm loving if I do this, but maybe I'm not. And so much that goes into that, much that goes into that. Economic systems are built, they rise and they fall upon things that Catholic social teaching definitely has an opinion on. Um, and so it's a, it's a complex topic and yet a very simple topic. What kind of questions have you for us? Okay, well, class just. Oh. Darren. Please give me your second one first and your first one second. Okay. I'm just kidding, I just like to say that. Uh, well, my second one was um, what would you. Yeah, I probably would have had to do that. Well, but it's, you know, so here's the, here's the benefit of doing what Dara is doing right now. She said, I could probably go to Catholic.com and find my answer. The great thing about this is that maybe other people would not have thought about this same question, but by you asking it in front of everybody else, it helps everybody else. So I wouldn't say, I mean, obviously, I, so my question is, what would you say to people who find themselves called to do acts of love and service for non-human forms, like animals? What would you say to people who find themselves called to do acts of love and service to non-humans, meaning animals? We would say we agree with that. Yet, yet, uh, always with the understanding that, that humans are the pinnacle of, of God's creation and not animals, and so you, you can't sacrifice humans for animals. Um, like those t-shirts that, you know, like a polar bear or something like that standing and holding up a sign that says, save the human babies, you know. Um, kind of making that point that sometimes a lot of people will be like all about saving the, uh, the polar bears or saving an animal form, but yet not really caring about, about that which is the pinnacle of creation. First question. Uh, so, okay, so I find myself extremely overwhelmed in places such as uh, one particular memory, I was in Vancouver, and they had just had a homeless shelter um, unexpectedly shut down, and it was particular to those who had a, intense drug addictions. So there are literally hundreds within a two-block radius. What do you do? Yeah, so how, I mean, it's almost, she's saying she found herself just so overwhelmed when you see the need, and in, in, in this particular situation, a homeless shelter that found itself having to shut down, and then all of a sudden those who were being served by the homeless shelter are now on the streets, and what can you do? What can you do? Uh, feel sorrow, I definitely, you know, if you're not feeling sorrow at something like that, then something's wrong, something's broken within you. And yet, if you feel nothing but sorrow throughout your whole lifetime because of the plight of others, then you also have to say something's broken within the hope that lives within you, the hope in Christ. And um, the, the phrase that, that gets thrown around a lot, but I think it's, it's a beautiful phrase, is, is think globally, act locally. Because you probably right now are not being called to serve homeless men and women in Vancouver, Canada. But you probably are being called to do something here and now. An example I've been using recently is my little sister. She saw that her children um, were going to school and there were classmates of her children who would have birthday but didn't want to let anybody know they were having birthday. And the reason was because they couldn't afford cupcakes to have a party for the class. And so although it would be their birthday, they were kind of like pretending like it wasn't because they were embarrassed. And so my sister found out about that, and she started um, a non-for-profit called Birthday in a Box, MHK. And so she went around to businesses and got donations and, and talked to all of the schools in Manhattan. And so now every kid who's struggling financially 
uh, when it's, uh, they're approaching the birthday of this child, uh, whoever's on like free and reduced lunches are also a part of this, that they can partake of this if they so choose. And they prepare a box that has cake mix, the cupcake stuff. I don't make cupcakes, so whatever it takes to make cupcakes. And then I think like a 20 or $25 gift card so that the mom or dad can buy a gift for that child as well. It's perfect, right? It's perfect. Um, and so you just keep praying that the Lord reveals to you what you can do. And, and then maybe your message gets out there, you know, and that's why I, I've talked a lot about my little sister, because that's the kind of stuff that then inspires people in Vancouver, Connecticut to help out. And, um, and that's what we're, we're ultimately hoping for. Leonardo. Hey, I'm going to Colombia here soon. So could you ask your question nice and loud and in Spanish? Sí, amigo. Por favor. You know, the Puerto Rican accent is very difficult. Uh, <laughs> so you're asking about, about politics and, and the Catholic stance, and so you're first and foremost a Catholic, and, but in regards to, to such political topics, tell me more. Now you can answer it. Question me in, in English. So what are we supposed to do if we see that we have politicians who say they're Catholic in our constituency, but they're voting in favor of things like abortion? Yeah, so, do, you know. Also, what does the, what does the church do in, in, when this type of thing happens? Like, they contact the politicians, like, trying to rectify what's happening? Yeah, so. <clears throat> When the church is, it, so it's all very, very complicated. There's no really easy answers. And every person has to vote their conscience. Many people would say that there are, is a hierarchy of issues. Okay? And something like abortion would be higher than just something like um, whatever, whatever other topic it would want to be, you know, uh, your, your, your views on school funding. But there's nothing that says if you're so adamantly passionate about school funding and you're voting for somebody because of that and, and you despise the fact that they are pro-abortion or at least they're not anti-abortion enough and, and you're not voting for them because of the anti-abortion, you know, because of, if you're not voting for them because they are pro-abortion or because they're not strong enough anti-abortion, it's not in and of itself sinful. Um, but yet you got to look long and hard at this and pray through this. Uh, just because somebody says they're Catholic doesn't mean that they live as a Catholic. Even Pope Benedict himself asked one time, and, and he was known to be kind of, they call him the Rottweiler, kind of the, this strong, strong Catholic, like, either you're in or you're out kind of guy. But in an interview that I'd read that he did, uh, that's been published, you know, so he obviously knew this was being published. He was just talking about the fact that, some, that there are many who exteriorly looking in appear to be on the outside, but they're more on the inside than some of those who maybe would even call themselves Catholic but don't act in such a way. And so it's the same thing with politicians. You have to look at kind of their voting record. You have to look at what they've done. And, and the problem with it is, is that there's no perfect political party, you know? The, both the Democrats and the Republicans get it wrong uh, in many ways, and they get it right in many ways. Um, and so you have to look at each candidate, and you have to then form your own conscience well. Now, what does the Catholic Church do if somebody is calling themselves Catholic? Um, you know, Archbishop Nauman, who's the Archbishop of Kansas City, at one point asked uh, our Governor Sebelius not to receive communion because she continued to do some things that were seemingly contrary to Catholic teaching and much of it had to do with her voting record when it came to things like abortion. And, uh, and he even, I think, kind of put out a, a, 
a memo he talked to her in person a number of times and she continued to present herself for communion and she didn't change the way she voted or the way she would stand on certain issues and so at that point he put something out publicly that went into the papers saying this is what I have asked Mrs. Sebelius to do and or, and she has yet to do it and so I'm now asking my priests not to give her communion because it is scandalous for her to say I'm in communion with the Catholic Church when in fact she's living her life and, and showing herself in a public way to vote in, in something in a way that is very un-Catholic. Um, so that's what he asked to have happen and I think one priest disagreed with him and so she continued going to his church and this guy would give her communion. So, you know, all of that will be sorted out in God's own time. But that's what the Catholic Church would generally do in a situation like that. And sometimes people throw around the word excommunication. Excommunication isn't something like the Pope, like, <laughs> excommunicated. Excommunication is something primarily that we do to ourselves. Communication meaning in communion with or not. And so we excommunicate ourselves almost every time we sin in a mortal way. And most excommunications, I mean, again, that's strong, it's strong language, and it's not 100% appropriate language for me to use. But if you get to kind of like the, the word and the way it's all broken down, confession then brings you back into communion with God as you have separated yourself from communion. It's not like some Archbishop Nauman is like, oh, yeah, ooh, I don't like the color of that guy's shirt, excommunicated, or, you know, well, I don't, just don't like the way that politician looked at me, so excommunicated. It's not, it's not like that either. It's about the teachings of the church, which are steady and true and easy to look at and say, okay, there's the teaching, and I choose not to follow. Chase. So a Sunday collection, and how does that work with social justice and stuff like that? Um, every church generally has certain kind of charities that it that it will help fund. And sometimes when you talk about what are the charities, sometimes it has to do with pro-life things, sometimes it has to do with homeless shelters. For example, what is the, the group here in Manhattan that I know we contribute to on a regular basis? Shepherd's Crossing. We also contribute on a very regular basis to Manhattan Catholic Schools. Every month we send a check over there um, because this is for the education of children. Uh, for, the, for those who are struggling with you know, homelessness or need a place to stay. And so we will regularly contribute to that. Now every year there's also special collections that kind of take place throughout either our nation or worldwide. Uh, Catholic Relief Services. This is a national or a worldwide organization that helps the poor wherever they may be. And so every year there's a, a Catholic Relief Services CRS collection. And you usually see things about it in the bulletin if those people who have signed up in parishes, and in most parishes it's all about signing up in the parish and getting these envelopes. And you get a whole packet of envelopes and then the CRS collection, for example, would be, uh, I'm going to just make this up, but like the third, you know, Sunday of September. It's CRS weekend. And so maybe the priest will say something about me, there'll be some blurbs in the, in the bulletin, but when you come through your envelopes, you're like, oh, what's this? The CRS collection. And then that also gets then div divvied up. Another thing that's very, very much a part of what we're about is Catholic Charities. Uh, Catholic Charities, there's an office mostly in Salina, but there's one here as well that does just a tremendous amount of good for uh, those who are in need. But, but so the collection, yes, yeah, sometimes it goes in general operating budget here to pay for the lights and the heat, but some of that will also then go to our regular things that we pay for, like Shepherd's Crossing or uh, Manhattan Catholic Schools or that kind of stuff. And then there's also special collections that go along with it year by year or, or month by month, whatever. Yeah. So this is regarding the Indonesia. Like like Chinese children? The youth the youth in Asia? Oh, Uh, now you do. I know, I know, I know. Isn't that, worse? Isn't that the worst? You do such a good job in your second language, but still jokes are the hardest things to learn. So, yeah, so anyway, please ask the question. Yeah, so, uh, in a situation, like, for example, um, a person has an accident, and they have to go to the hospital, 
is uh, connected to the so, so I'll, uh, go, go ahead. I think I already know the answer to the question that you're going to ask. But. So there's basically ordinary means of life support and extraordinary means of life support. Okay, we can keep a person alive by doing a ton of extraordinary things for a long, long time. What they would consider to be, and, and Father Ryan, I'm, this is something I would, this is a question that I'm not confident enough with in myself. I'm, I'm quite confident, but it's an important enough question that I would check Catholic.com or just refer to Father Ryan because he's brilliant. But the ordinary means of, of keeping a person alive, food and water. You can never say, I'm not going to feed that person, or I'm not going to give them water, okay? Um, and, and there are very minor caveats in that, okay? But you can't simply say, I'm going to starve a person to death, or I'm going to, I'm going to make them dehydrate to the point where they die. Now, do they have to keep, like, heart things on or brain things, you know, whatever else the extraordinary things would be? No, the church doesn't say that. And so there's very special cases. Um, Terry Schiavo is the name of a woman who was in a, a vegetative state, but basically they, they starved her to death. And, um, and the church stood strongly against that. That was a case, I think, back in like 2005 when John Paul II was dying. And um, I just remember that case very well. And that was very much against what the Catholic Church would say. And it's not about the money. I mean, you know, the church can help find the money to, to give the person that kind of care. But you're not called upon to do every human possible thing to keep somebody alive who would die of natural causes, or at least they would die of that which they have. But food and, and water would be considered uh, good enough. Yes. Yeah, uh, and then this, actually, i got to go hear confession. So God bless you guys. One final question, Leonardo. But I'm going to let Father Ryan answer it. Unless it's so good as I'm walking out the door, I'm like, i got to answer that question. I might be back. Correct. So yes, disconnecting them from life support so that they can die from natural causes. That's what he said. Euthanasia. <laughs> Euthanasia is actually what? It's doing something to put that person You know, and so maybe you can allow that person to do something to themselves. So that's so euthanasia would be an active movement towards death. Brittany. So, if the Catholic Church is against with a death penalty. So, <clears throat> the death penalty. Did we cover this? Isn't this in here? I, I'm pretty sure. No? No? We didn't cover it? Okay. So, the death penalty is basically uh, we would say, based on human dignity, all people are created in the image and likeness of God, and that anybody who um, is a grave threat to the community, like we've, we want to rehabilitate him enough, we want to put him in incarceration, you know, but if he's a gr grave threat to the community, that if, if there's, there's no other option, death penalty could be possible. So that's a short answer to a complicated question. Right, and so that's, yeah, this has been an issue with um, Pope Francis on this, is he's basically saying, and even uh, JP2 on this, he's saying that there's really, there are a lot of means for us to keep people out of harm's way. 
so we can we can help them out now rehabilitation might not be an option but death shouldn't be the first thing that we go to oh we're gonna kill this person because killing a person in order to like even it's almost kind of like the capital punishment that Jesus went through Rome's claim to that was like saying don't mess with Rome or you get hung up on the cross that isn't an effective means of stopping criminals from doing stuff so you know let's we, we've got to use something else Trent you had a question I was thinking about you talking about extraordinary needs of the Sport. I didn't know what the Catholic Church's stance on uh, resuscitation was. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, that, like, so resuscitation, if, it, if it's necessary for somebody, um, but we're going to also respect if they have a DNR, that type of thing. So, um, it, it just depends on on certain cases and stuff like that. So, um, but I mean, you're not going to do it on a 98 year old woman who you know because you're going to crack her ribs and stuff like that. the 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 idea is uh, basically if you if you are going to actually cause more pain to somebody um, with that procedure, it's probably not worth doing that procedure. So it might be an extraordinary, over-the-top thing. Vanessa. So, um, kind of over the top, piggybacking off that, what you said about and I might have missed it, I stepped out for a minute. If somebody is terminally ill, and, I mean, you're giving them food and water, obviously, but then being, it, I mean, they're still in a lot of pain, and let's say they are, like, an older person, and they might, Want to be like, let go, you know, and not necessarily on life support, but that you might want to be like, like, physician assisted suicide. So, yeah, physician assisted suicide is not on that, not on the docket for so we would help them. Um, if they're going through pain, we're going to take away the pain as much as possible, we're going to give them, you know certain things in order for that pain to be resided. Um, so we're not going to actually like um, help them go actively towards death. Like give them a pill to die. That's that's what, you know, uh, euthanasia is. Um, but if their, their body, your body is going to kick, uh, is going to do stuff in order for you to know that it's going to shut down. But we're going to try to help them, um, you know, by food and water. And it, it's really case by case. But with with pain, we can we could do as much as we can to alleviate that pain. Um, but yeah, I don't. It's it's complicated. You had a question. Right, so then you'd have your policy that's given to you by the, the hospital, and the ho hospital policy should be, and depending on if it's a Catholic hospital and what the policy is for the overall thing, it's it's based on your conscience as well. So if, if uh, and, and like you said, you're confused, but it's like, gosh, man, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to put her through more pain, and then... Uh, but my policy is she doesn't have a DNR, and that's really, you know, like forward thinking is um, she's a she has a high risk of this. So we're going to ask the the family or her. This is possible with a D, with a with an actual resuscitation. These these are things that can come out of it. Is that something that you want to happen? And so that communication really needs to happen. Um, but for you, like as a nurse, um, if that's policy and there's, she doesn't have a DNR, that's like you. I've, I've done it to somebody over 
Right. Right. And and, and like you, like I said, you know, it's like that's it. It's it stinks for them, you know, because then she's living for so many other days or whatnot with more pain than when she was previous. And so um, that's that's why you know you we end of life issues with yourself. You really need to know what the Catholic Church says and why why we believe these and we need to have that conversation put it in your medical records and say this is what I this is what I want you know get your um, uh, that some the, the will thing I can't, I can't power of attorney and there's other stuff too yeah and so and the living will and, and, and all that stuff you guys need to yeah, think about those things Chase. Um, does the church come out with these big statements or like advocacy for them, especially like in the U.S. and Europe? Do they believe that justice is there? So like the, the refugee crisis, has the church put out anything? Um, nothing's coming to mind right at the moment, but there's definitely policy on it. And it always comes down to um, that it's a human being. Take them in. There's the they they. Um, I actually really enjoyed what our bishop said, of, kind of at the escalation of this recently. They really said um, quite a quite a bit about like, you know, why we need to look at kind of both sides of the pictures because uh, people have a right to live in their own country. So the people who have them there have the responsibility to take care of their constituents. And so for them to be fleeing, there's a problem over here, and we, they need to be held responsible for it. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be able to welcome them and be able to say, hey, what are your needs? And we're going we're gonna to do this. And so the, the, there's definitely stuff out there. I just can't name um, what, what it's been said. And Pope Francis is at a... Uh, in fact, even on a Wednesday audience, when I was in Rome a year ago, he talked about immigration, and so he's he's talked about it quite a bit. Thanks. Any more hands? All right, I'm going to hand it over to Maria because we've got some housekeeping stuff because. Easter is not too far away, and next week is spring break, and so you all will not be here. I won't be here, and then we're going to have a lot of stuff, and I'm just going to let her talk about it. Perfect. Well, um, we kind of talked about it a little bit last week, so if you were gone last week, um, as you're leaving, you're going to want to grab one of these. This is kind of a more detailed schedule for Holy Week. That's the week after spring break, the week leading up to the Easter Vigil, where you'll receive the sacraments. So um, if you were gone last week, grab one of these. It should tell you everything that you need to know. And if you have any questions about it, feel free um, to ask me or, or or one of the team members or father would be happy um, to help. So um, this is our last normal uh, class or session. So when we get back from spring break, um, we will meet on Tuesday evening, but it will be preparing for the Easter Vigil. And we've got stuff basically every other night that week um, that you're invited to participate in. So I'll just let you take a look at these and let us know if you have any questions. Grab one if you don't have one. Yeah. Question? Yeah, I'm just looking at it. Mm -hmm. Sunday, March 26th, mm -hmm. and it says Tuesday, March 27th. Oh. That's a good. So it's probably Sunday, March 25th. Is that right? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Good catch, Leo. Good catch. Yes. No, no, no. You're, you're right. So little typo there. Thank you. Yes. Sunday, March 25th. Mm-hmm. Other questions? All right. Father, do you want to lead us in closing prayer? Sure. 
We just close in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, you made us in your image and likeness and you sent your Son to bring us back to that original likeness and that beautiful image. And through your Holy Spirit, be with us and guide us in all that we do. And we ask all these things through Jesus Christ, your Son, and we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, have a good night.